Merrimack TV is committed to our community. From gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of town and school board meetings, to updates on town services and projects, we aim to keep you connected. Uh, good morning, I'm Kyle Fox, Public Works Director for the Town of Merrimack. Hi, I'm Diane Trippett. I'm the Town Clerk Tax Collector for the Town of Merrimack. I'm Captain Matt Tarleton with the Merrimack New Hampshire Police Department. And keep the public informed of every motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And many moments, so you can be confident that we're here for you. Thanks for watching. Stay connected. Follow Merrimack TV on Facebook. Welcome to the July 28th, 2020 emergency meeting of the Merrimack School Board. If you could please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, the next um, item on the agenda is public participation guidelines for um, the remote meeting. Because we are remote, we can't take live testimony. So if anyone wants to send any public comments, please send them one of two ways. One, you can send them in an email to public comments at sau26.org. Or if you go on the district website at www.sau26.org, on the posting of our meeting tonight, you will see a linked form that you may complete. I'll repeat that again. You can send an email to public comments at sau26.org, or if you go on the district website, which is www.sau26.org, on the posting of our meeting tonight, you will see a linked form that you may complete. Regardless, we do require your name and address for the record. So if you are sending an email to public comments at sau26.org, you must include your name and address for the record. Based on the amount of information we get tonight, our goal is always to read off verbatim the comments as we receive them. If the comments become too heavy in volume, we would just have to not read those comments tonight, but we would put, uh, we would just not read them into the testimony. Um, it's really an all or nothing proposition. Regardless, we will put all the public comments out in our minutes for tonight's meeting, but we would not be able to read them tonight if we can't read all of them. That has yet to happen, um, but we will address it up front just in case we find ourselves in that position. The next item um, is the district policy on the use of masks by students and staff. Um, Mark McLaughlin. Well, thank you very much, and I want to thank the board uh, again for agreeing to this emergency meeting. You know, and I want to just point out that since this uh, pandemic happened, uh, we've been really fortunate to have a board who's been um, willing to meet almost sometimes uh, on a moment's notice uh, uh, that we can address an emerging issue. And this is an urging issue with the Mark. board's indulgence. I'll just try to set the context for why Mark. Mark. we're having an emergency meeting tonight. Mark. Yes. Um, you're actually cutting out. Yes. You may want to just um, go yes. to cut your video out so we can hear you a little more clearly. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Might that be better? It is. Is, is that better to everyone else? Okay. Go ahead. Thank no. you. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. So, um, <clears throat> So the issue of masks has been one, uh, and I say unfortunately, um, really, I think uh, that has been a, a really uh, difficult one for, uh, for so many, um, because there are lots of strong opinions on both sides. Um, the issue for schools is actually, um, when all is said and done, quite, uncomplicated. And that is that if we are trying to meet the challenge of providing a reopening that brings students and staff back on campus, 
in the midst of a viral pandemic, um, then I, it would seem that the place that would be most likely to exercise as many safety protocols as could be would be a school. And I would remind everybody listening that we have not had school yet during a pandemic because two weeks in to the pandemic, we closed uh, schools. So we don't know what it's like to teach uh, 4,000 students with 800 staff in the midst of a pandemic. And I'd also point out that this will happen at the end of the summer uh, where uh, we have seen spikes all across the country. And even in New Hampshire, uh, WMUR on Sunday reported uh, 68 off of the DHHS, 68 uh, new cases just on Sunday. That number is a significant bump from what we would have seen just several weeks ago. So given that fact, uh, the school district has been working very, very hard to create a model of reopening that would provide as much safety as we can, knowing that we cannot be flawless on this subject. And we have tried very hard to encourage our community to be partners with us in this. So when I wrote a memo to the uh, community uh, right after the meeting a few weeks ago, I indicated that um, the Merrimack School District uh, would strongly encourage the use of masks. I also said in that letter that um, if it were, uh, if we just relied on the science, this wouldn't be an issue. However, it is an issue, and the issue really is one of enforcement. And uh, with all due respect to our governor, when he issued his guidelines, he did no help whatsoever to school districts across the state by um, not tackling this issue for us. Uh, we very much appreciate local control, but there are times, in my opinion, when uh, a situation is such that it uh, crosses the line into uh, something else uh, that would be much stronger. But there has been no executive or legislative movement on this subject. And so it has been left to school districts to um, make a requirement and then to try to find the tools to enforce that requirement. Now, anybody out there watching knows that you can't go into a grocery store without a sign that says mask required and how many people get turned away in the line when you're checking out who are not wearing it. So as a practical matter, that becomes a very, very difficult proposition for uh, teachers and administrators to enforce. And it's not as easy as to say, well, just, um, you know, make them do it. Um, it's as with many things about schools, it's much more complicated than that. So, um, so, uh, that has become a very, very big issue. So um, I am, we have been trying to uh, figure out a way that our teachers can have course, a, a um, strategy that we all know works. And again, I'm going to say, it should be a surprise to nobody that we are trying to bring safety uh, and security and peace of mind to our students and our staff who very much require um, reassurance. These are very challenging times. And uh, unlike many other entities, you have a lot of students, a lot of people in a small space, and it's very different, a very different environment. So our uh, hybrid model that requires um, uh, students to come in uh, two waves during the school week is intended to enforce a social distancing rule, which is one of the other things that we know really works. So um, I will just reiterate, requirements without support from the executive or the legislative branches of government provides an expectation 
with very little in the way of enforcement. So the board uh, has um, been, uh, you know, I'm very grateful to the board and its uh, efforts to continue to encourage administration to seek a way uh, to address this really sticky issue uh, in a way that puts safety first so that we can do our primary mission, which is education. And so uh, we have uh, believe that we have perhaps found a way. And uh, my reason for asking uh, Chair Gualyumi for an emergency uh, meeting tonight is so that we can share what we have um, developed, um, which has taken you know, the last several weeks to do. Um, so that the board could initially deliberate. And then when we have our regularly scheduled board meeting in August, the possibility exists that the board could, uh, if it wishes, make a move uh, that would uh, codify the policy that we're going to potentially that we'll talk about tonight so that it can be in place for students and teachers and families to know with still about a month before school starts so that uh, there can be a lot of processing around that. Um, so I'm very grateful for the patience of the board as we have tried to work out um, the uh, issue that we have been faced with for the last um, several weeks since the governor made his announcement. And uh, I'm gonna turn it to board member, uh, uh, Chair Gualyumi. And then after that, when we get to the uh, reading of the two policies, uh, that are for your review tonight, I'll talk to you about how we came to where we're at, but I'll just turn it to Board uh, Chair Gualyumi now. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thanks everyone uh, for joining and um, thanks everyone for listening at home. I know everyone's busy and taking time out of your busy lives is really appreciated. This is a very hard time for all of us and we are going through it together. It's very stressful for parents, it's stressful for kids, it's stressful for our teachers, our administrators, and our school board in our broader community. So first of all, I just want to thank you um, for having the patience that you've had and allowing us to work through and try to come up with the most thoughtful plan. We understand that the plan that we have will, it's not perfect, and we are not in a perfect or ideal situation right now, um, but, um, we do want you to know that we appreciate your understanding. Uh, we are doing our best to deliver you a thoughtful plan. And because times are changing, there will be changes to those plans. So I'd like to uh, thank you, Mark, um, because we've had some discussions as it relates to this mask issue. Um, I can tell you it was something that just wasn't sitting right with me personally um, and in many others. Uh, we've heard from many of you um, many of you we have not been able to respond back to yet. You will get a response from us, but we, we have seen your feedback and your input, but most importantly, um, the reason that um, this meeting is existing is really due to a lot of collaboration in the district, um, some good research, and the idea of being able to put something forward um, that I think is pretty concrete um, should the board choose to adopt um, a such of a plan and Mark will go into greater details um, shortly. So um, so with that, again, I thank you and Mark, go ahead if you can kind of walk through the background, how this came about and really, you know, kind of what um, what options exist. There's three options that the board could consider and possibly um, some others or a hybrid or, or something. So I think I'm looking forward to the discussion tonight. I think it's a good step for, um, it's a good step potentially for our community. And I just uh, thank, thank everyone. So I'm happy to do it. I'll just, uh, in case people are watching and wonder why I'm not um, on video, <laughs> uh, my connection is pretty weak where I am tonight. And so we've removed the video so that um, I can speak and try not to freeze up. So that's, but I'm here. Um, so uh, again, um, the, 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 big, the biggest issue that I, have encountered around the issue of masks uh, as a leader in this district has been one of enforcement. It's, it's one thing to say, make it happen, but it's a very, another, a very different prospect to provide the teachers with the tools to make that realistic. And, um, and what we cannot have, we have, we have um, a big 
task ahead of us, which is to educate our students um, remotely when necessary, in, on location when possible. And we cannot uh, uh, use up any precious time uh, with fights about masks. We just can't. And, um, and it will be very, uh, I think, without the actions that we're trying to take tonight, uh, it would have become a daily battle that we just cannot uh, take the time to, to uh, work on. We must focus on instruction and safety. And so the issue has always been one of enforcement. And I am, I, I, again, I will just say by way of a background, um, I was hoping very much for there to be some um, uh, leadership on this issue at the state level, and it has not happened. And so as a result, individual uh, districts are forced to work out a problem that really should be worked out at a much higher level. Having said that, um, I have consulted with uh, uh, a variety of uh, folks to try to understand what tools might we have at our disposal uh, to support enforcement. And my uh, research and uh, research that uh, our uh, attorneys have conducted has shown us that there is an RSA, uh, it's RSA 200 colon 39. Um, it's a statute from 1971 that in short, uh, provides an opportunity for schools and their designees, so teachers, to remove a student from a classroom if they present a hazard as defined by the local school board. So this came about years and years ago. The most obvious example would be if a student uh, had chicken pox, let's say, and came into school, uh, they would present a hazard to others uh, because of contagion. And so it would be uh, appropriate under RSA 200 colon 39 to um, say, well, you really can't be here right now. We'll still teach you when you're feeling well enough, but you just can't be here. So when we learned of this, uh, at first it seemed like, okay, well, we've, we've landed it. Well, not really, um, because there really should be a a policy adopted by the local governing body that would use RSA 200 colon 39 as the basis um, for its position on the matter. So I then asked uh, if we could adopt such a policy from the New Hampshire School Boards Association or what have you. And uh, it would appear that really there uh, is perhaps one in the works, but not one at the moment. So then the question is, okay, so how can we make such a policy? And so uh, our attorney has uh, worked on this for us and has crafted um, two versions uh, because in conferring with um, board chair Gualiumi, um, she expressed a desire to provide the board with a variety of options rather than just one. So, um, so what um, we have for the board tonight would be the presentation of three options relative to the use of masks. One, you already know, and that's what I discussed with the board at the July 13th meeting, which was um, the strong recommendation of students um, to wear masks. Um, and that is still a viable option that the board may well wish to take. However, we have two other um, options, one of which is a uh, somewhat graduated uh, step up from the encourage um, that we'll read to you tonight um, that requires masks in, uh, to summarize in public spaces like hallways and when you're passing to, you know, from one space to another, um, but that it would not require masks in a classroom if you can ensure six feet of space uh, between the participants in the classroom. The second policy that the board would review tonight is um, a more stringent policy 
and that one really says that um, masks would be required at all times um, in all situations. Um, and that is certainly a defensible position. Um, but the point is whether it, uh, it's, it's not up to me, it's up to the board to discuss, which is why I'm, we're also grateful that, that the board's agreed to meet tonight. But what we've tried to do is present three um, distinct options for review. But I just want to reiterate that from the time of uh, the governor's announcement, which coincided almost to the day with our, um, uh, with, uh, our announcement uh, <clears throat> about masks, to this day, it has taken some time to uh, develop you know, to go through the process that I just described to you, do the research, confer, figure it out. Um, and so during that time, uh, I know that the board perhaps and the community have had questions um, and those questions we're trying to address, but you know, as with everything about this, we can't be rushed. Uh, there takes, it takes time. So in any event, um, that's really the summary of how we got to where we are at tonight, where I'm pleased to be able to provide the board with enforcement strategies um, that will also very importantly provide an ability for our teachers to focus on what they should be doing uh, and not to get caught up in back and forths about uh, the um, relative merits of mask wearing in the midst of an ongoing uh, crisis like the one that we've got. So, at this time, um, Cinda, if you'd like, I can uh, try to share the screen. And then uh, if you'd like me to read the first policy, or if you prefer a discussion first, it's entirely up to you. Um, is everyone okay if we just go forward and let Mark read the policies and then we'll start the discussion after that? Let's do that, Mark. You could go ahead and read through. Okay. Thanks. I'm gonna... Uh, I'm going to uh, try to share the screen. So uh, just one second here. Can you all see that? Can you see it should say emergency policy on personal protective measures? No. Not yet. Maybe it's just what a second. Perhaps Cinda, one of us could share it. It has a more reliable internet connection. Than, that might than we help. Could probably right. Andy. Did you make, Mark, did you make changes um, to the policies? No. No. Andy, do you have it handy that you could share? Yep. Give me a second to explode it up. Make it bigger, in other words. Just a second. Thank I'm you. Not, I'm not on my computer that has that email address. I'm just trying to open the, the document itself. Give me a sec. Shoot. And just well, close my browser. No, so go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, while well, he's looking for that, Mark, is there, um, or while we're waiting for him to open that, does anyone have any questions they want to put out there right now before we go through the policies? Oh, now, Mark, yours is. You see, the, uh, yeah. you see the zoom window. Yeah. Oh. Once you open it, it should be good. Once you, there we go. Okay, you're there. I'll, I'll have it open in case you get frozen. Okay, so you do see it? We yep. do. Okay. So uh, this one, just for the board and for the community watching, this is the, um, the slightly softer version. So emergency policy on personal protective measures, face masks, and cloth face coverings. Findings. The state of emergency declared an executive order 2020 of the COVID-19 pandemic. The extension has declared that the Center for Disease Control reports that COVID-19 is spread mainly from person to person, that COVID-19 is currently spreading very easily and sustainably that COVID-19 is spreading more efficiently than influenza and that the best way to prevent illness is to avoid being exposed to COVID-19 by taking the following steps. 
Maintain good social distance, about six feet. Wash your hands often with soap and water. And if soap and water are not available, use a hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Routinely clean and disinfect frequently touched surfaces and cover your mouth and nose with a cloth face covering around others. The board makes the same findings. COVID-19 is easily spread from person to person and that the steps recommended by the governor are reasonable measures to be taken by community members, staff, and students to reduce the risk of a debilitating and potentially deadly disease. The board finds that within the Merrimack School District bounds, there have been persons who have tested positive for the coronavirus. The citizens of the district also travel outside of the geographic bounds of the district and interact with citizens both within and outside the state. Merrimack also has a significant number of citizens from other states stopping within Merrimack as they travel to other destinations. The suburban nature of Merrimack increases the necessity for protective measures to prevent the hazard of contagion and spread of the virus. The board also finds that remote learning has not been as effective a tool for educating students in the Merrimack School District as in-person education in the schools, and that second to student and community safety, it is important that the district reopen its schools to students as soon as prudently possible. The congregation of students and staff in school buildings presents an increased risk of exposure to and spread of COVID-19. The proper use of medical masks and even face uh, cloth face coverings can reduce the hazards presented by educating students within a building and will allow for broader educational access to in-person instruction. The failure to use a mask or face covering in the context of a school creates a hazard to the individual who declines to use the mask and a hazard to others who are proximate to the student staff member. The district has a duty to provide for the health and sanitation of its schools. See New Hampshire RSA 194 colon three Roman numeral eight. This duty includes the daily administration and provision of educational services to students at the school facility, including staff, student, and parent safety. See RSA 194-C colon four, Roman numeral two J. These requirements are reiterated in state regulations. State law mandates that whenever any student exhibits symptoms of contagion or is a hazard to himself or others, he shall be excluded from the classroom and parents or guardians shall be notified as soon as possible. See New Hampshire RSA 200 colon 39, emphasis added. The board finds that scientific research has emerged that students age 10 and above present the same risk of viral spread as adults. To some extent, there may be reduced risk of viral spread by students below the age of 10. Mask and covering requirements. On the basis of these findings, the board implements the following policy directives. General requirements, all staff shall wear medical masks or cloth, cloth face coverings in the school building and on campus when they are less than six feet from one another person from another person or moving in common corridors. Classes shall be configured so that when possible educators may be able to have a socially distanced location in the room for general instruction. All visitors on campus shall be required to don a mask when they are less than six feet from another person or moving in common corridors. No person, including a student, shall be required to wear a mask if their disability or a medical condition prevents them from doing such. Staff, including contracted service providers who work with deaf students or hard of hearing students, students learning to read and students who rely on lip reading shall wear clear masks, which enhance service provision. The CDC guidelines on mask and cloth face covering shall be made available to all staff. Masks shall not be required during outdoor recess or outdoor physical education, provided social distancing is in place. Mark, you missed a sentence, I believe. I'm sorry. The district shall endeavor to maintain a supply. Uh, it's like two sentences above, right above the CDC guidelines. Oh, I'm sorry, Matt. I'm sorry, Matt. Thank you, Andy. The district shall endeavor to maintain a supply of masks for students and staff who do uh, actually do not have access to a mask or cloth face covering. So you see, we've got some uh, things that we need to fix here. Thank you, Andy. Um, a kindergarten through third grade. 
uh, I would just state to the board that that uh, needs to be changed to uh, pre-K through third grade. So that would be another uh, suggested change. All students in uh, kindergarten or pre-K through grade three shall be taught the proper use of a mask. Students in kindergarten through grade three or pre-K through grade three shall not be required to wear a mask or face covering, but shall be encouraged to wear a mask when social distancing of less than, is less than six feet. Nothing herein shall prohibit a parent prohibit a parent from requiring that their child wear a mask. However, enforcing that requirement shall be the responsibility of that child's parent. Parents of students in pre-K through third grade shall inform the district in writing if they do not wish their child to wear a mask. Any student who is deemed by school staff to present a risk of contagion or a health hazard to themselves or others by virtue of not wearing a mask shall be removed from the classroom setting or not permitted to enter the classroom setting and the parents shall be required to pick up their child. See New Hampshire RSA 200 colon 39. Fourth through 12th grade. All students in fourth through grade through 12th grade shall be required to wear a mask or face covering in the following circumstances when entering or exiting a school building when in the corridors or transitioning from class to class, when they are less than six feet from another person, when on a school bus or other student transportation and in such other settings and environments as the building principal deems appropriate, provided the students have been notified of the requirement. Any student in the circumstances listed above who is not wearing a mask shall be asked to wear a mask. Any student who is wearing a mask in, in an improper fashion shall be asked to wear their mask properly, that is, safely covering both mouth and nose. Any student who refuses to do such shall be deemed a health hazard to themselves and others, shall be removed from the school building, their parent guardian shall be contacted and required to take their child unless uh, and until such time as they are willing to comply with the face mask or cloth covering requirement C New Hampshire RSA 200 colon 39. Duration. This is a temporary policy based on a health emergency. This policy shall remain in place until such time as the governor rescinds his emergency order, modifies his order to eliminate the face mask recommendation, or the board determines that there is no longer a substantial risk that unmasked persons will present a hazard to themselves or others in the school setting, whichever event is the latter. The board shall review this policy regularly, regularly to determine whether it remains appropriate. And then there are a variety of legal references uh, that are included. So um, Cinda, I'm not sure if um, you'd like me uh, to refer the next to the second somewhat more stringent policy for the purposes of um, comparison and discussion, or if you wish. Yes, yeah, you could just go through that one and then we'll start the discussion. Okay. Thank so you. I will, um, so let me do this. Pardon me one second. Just uh, pulling it up here. Apologies. Can you see that? Okay. 
thanks for your patience. So um, the first part of this is identical to uh, what I just read. Um, uh, and the differences are, are down below. But um, so Cindy, would you prefer me to read it again or just um, go to the part that's different? Just the part that's different, please, for the sake of time. Yeah. Um, so on the basis of mask and face covering requirements, on the basis of these findings, the board implements the following policy directives. Um, actually, that is the same as well. It's down here. Mask or face covering required. All students, so this is the difference you noted in the other one, it was a distinction between, let's say pre-K to grade three and four through 12. Um, and, and that was primarily uh, directed to um, public spaces, but not necessarily in the classroom. Mask or face covering required. All students shall be required to wear a mask or face covering in the following circumstances. Um, when entering or exiting a school building, when in the corridors or transitioning from class to class, when they are less than six feet from another person, when on a school bus or other student transportation and in other such settings and environments as the principal deems appropriate provided the students have been notified of the requirement. Any student in the circumstances listed above who is not wearing a mask shall be asked to wear a mask. Um, and actually that's also the same as the other. So really the chief distinction between the two policies here is um, that all students, including pre-K to three would wear a mask and that it would be at all times. Uh, and that would be students and staff. And um, so one is um, uh, slightly more open in that um, if we can maintain six feet of distance in a classroom, uh, then uh, we would see it, uh, that the policy would allow masks not to be worn in that setting, but would be worn in the hallways. And then also not by the youngest students, it would be a recommendation in the other policy all masks all the time, no matter who you are and no matter where you are. So that's really the chief distinction uh, between the two policies, including the uh, other uh, policy, which uh, has to do with, um, uh, which has to do with the recommend, not the policy, but the recommendation that's currently in place, which is just to encourage masks. Okay. Anything else, Mark? Uh, no. Okay, and I will open it up for discussion and questions. Uh, questions from the board? Andy, Shannon, Brandy. Andy, go ahead. So in reading the policies, so essentially what, what this, the, the all mask policy, the second one that you read is identical in terms of content to what the fourth grade through 12th grade has in statement because neither one says that even in a classroom um, that they have to wear the mask. I mean, you made the comment that they always have to wear a mask, but yet it's really only when entering and as, as exiting a building in the corridors or in less than six feet from another person when on the school bus. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to see really that in my, in my opinion, and maybe I'm reading this completely wrong, the difference is, is that you've removed what the younger grades would need to do um, differently in the, in the more, the more, um, the less stringent one. Is that accurate or am I missing something that's more stringent even differently in the- No, I think I, no thank you. I think I, I maybe misspoke. The board, so, so in, you're right, the, the primary distinction in the two policies now has to do with a requirement for all students to wear a mask in the more strict one. And then um, in, in the less strict one, uh, students, uh, our youngest students not, but to be encouraged. The board has the prerogative um, in that one to add the additional component of uh, at all times in all places. So I perhaps misspoke. That's not in the, in the policy that's presented to you, but it's the board's discretion to add that. Uh, if 
if if it were your wish to do so. Okay, that I, for now I just wanted to call that out because what you what you implied and what this what policy said was a little different. So. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Okay, I'm good for now. I have more questions later, but I'll back away for now. Shannon. Um, a couple of questions that weren't specified, and uh, the first was, well, there was one thing I had a question on, and another thing wasn't specified, and then we talked about corridors and everything else, but we're going to be using cafeterias, so when going to tables and stuff like that, so lunchrooms would count unless you're sitting and eating, correct? Um, so that is not, um, that has not been determined yet by our team as to whether we would use cafeterias. Um, I was meeting with my leadership team just this morning on that very issue. And um, so we're not prepared at the moment, Shannon, to tell the board or our community what our plans are around lunch. Um, because the, remember the issue of congregating is a significant one. And, and so um, we, we have to do a little bit more work to determine even if going to the cafeteria would be possible. The alternative to that would be um, that lunch uh, would be provided in the classrooms and we are working on that too. So remember I said uh, several weeks ago that there are um, you know, a lot of things that take a lot of time to try to work out. That particular issue is one of them. So I'm not trying to be coy, but uh, we literally don't, we haven't worked that out yet. Okay, because I mean, I know a lot of things are specified and that one wasn't, so I didn't know if that was a mission or a, uh, a a deliberative one. Um, the other question I had, and I think it's about, you know, short term, long term, we are definitely responding to all of this based on COVID. But when you're looking at a policy that talks about um, not spreading uh, germs, and we think about what if we have a, a policy, could this sustain itself for things like uh, maybe an especially vicious flu season? those kind of things for future years. So I know it, the policy is written to specifically address this issue, but could it be expanded to really kind of have legs for long-term? So as needed, we can enact this with this policy backing it up. So that was the question I had when reading it at first, was is there a way to make giving it longevity and enacting the, uh, the procedure of, of using masks as needed um, on a seasonal basis? No, I appreciate your asking that. And um, so you're, um, you're inadvertently forecasting uh, a potential agenda item. <laughs> for our, um, but I, I haven't, uh, you know, had a, an opportunity to share with, um, with uh, uh, Board Chair Gualyumi, but we have been working on a, um, uh, on a policy that the New Hampshire school, uh, like a, a an, I forget exactly what it's called at the moment, but a, an illness or a contagious illness policy um, that is not COVID specific, um, but that is just plain old, how are we going to respond as a school system um, to all types of things, just like you're saying. And um, that I'm prepared, I'm having a meeting on that uh, actually, um, our HR director, Melissa Gagne, has been working on that uh, quite a bit uh, with our uh, New Hampshire school boards. And so I'm prepared to do a final review of that and then talk to the chair about whether that might be presented to the board, among many other things, on um, August 10th. So what I'm saying to you is that we have contemplated that and we definitely have something to share whenever the board wishes to see it. Thank you. Those are my questions so far. Brandy? Um, so I, my question is, if we adopted this, would this move us to a 100% um, in school from the start of school? Um, is, is that what we're trying to achieve? Or would we still focus on doing a hybrid approach for the first uh, few weeks of school until mid-October? Um, and wear masks and, and still do the hybrid approach. Is thank you for asking that because there can't be any confusion about that. So thank you. No, um, the model that we've put forward is a hybrid model as we put forward um, uh, back in, in July. This merely addresses 
the very real safety issues that we're trying to um, put in place for the times when students are in our schools. But it doesn't change. We're not trying to uh, into bring in masks so that we can be full time. Um, I mean, everybody back. And, and again, I want to say why. These things can't act in isolation. Um, we are, and, and I would just ask the community to think about what you have to do when you do simple tasks like go to the supermarket. You are asked to wear a mask. And when you're in line, you're asked to socially distance. Um, and I don't know about you, but I wear a mask, I socially distance and I get in my car and I put hand sanitizer on before I do anything else. So what, um, what we're trying to do is reflect the reality that we have a very serious health emergency right now, the extent to which nobody knows, no matter who says they do, nobody does. And um, we are trying to bring back some degree of normalcy by bringing students back to school. It is a huge undertaking when you have the health and safety of students and staff as your primary objective. So the hybrid model is intended to reduce the total number of uh, people in a building on any given day, couple that with a requirement to wear masks, couple that with our um, you know, ongoing campaign to remind people about the importance of um, hand washing and so on. Our nurses have a long established curriculum on that for the youngest students. We're working currently on making sure that that continues to get beefed up. So, um, so I just wanna say again, that this is all to be in conjunction with each other, not if this, then we don't have to do that. So thank you for asking the question because it provides an opportunity to clarify that because I would not want anybody to leave tonight thinking that that was the goal for now. We will review this, as I said, on October 30th or sooner as conditions warrant. Uh, if, if suddenly something changes and don't we all pray literally every night that that happens, um, then, then it, the quicker we can get back to school, the better. Um, so we'll review it. You know, We're not gonna just wait on data if the data comes in sooner than October 30th for the good or the bad. In other words, we're not gonna, if, if, if cases begin to um, pump up again, we're not going to wait until October 30th to make a move. And we're gonna to talk to the board on our August 10th about the um, criteria for that. Um, but in any event, I thank you for the opportunity to clarify that. Thanks. So um, just one quick follow-up question, Cinda, I'm sorry. No, that's fine, you're fine. Um, so if we adopted this policy, um, <clears throat> there are some concerns surrounding is there a gray area for those students that would not have the requirement? And I know you mentioned um, some of them, but um, is there verbiage that we could include that would be very specific in who, who falls into the bucket of not needing the required mask? Um, for example, somebody with anxiety um, might not necessarily fall into um, the bucket of needing it based on the verbiage that I heard. Um, however, somebody might feel very claustrophobic wearing a mask for that duration of time. So if that, would that be considered um, a, a reasonable medical, re, you know, right words, I apologize, but would that um, allow for a student to not be required to wear a mask? Or is that going to be determined on a per student basis? So as somebody comes into the building, um, those students that have already been identified um, with certain um, challenges, would those students be then given an opportunity to discuss the mask wearing or how do you determine that? Yep. No, it's a good question. So um, it's actually a loaded question. And, um, and I think that that's something that perhaps the board would want to um, maybe ask me to develop guidance on, uh, which I can do with our attorney. Um, what I, so how I would approach that is this. 
Um, you know, I, I've got to, I've just, I've got to be blunt um, because I, I just, you know, it's too important to mince words, right? We have to remember what the purpose of this is. The purpose is to keep our children, you know, your children safe, your children, and we are trying to keep them safe. And I go back to um, one of the things that was most frustrating to me, frankly, in some survey results was people who were lamenting that I kept using the word safe as if it's not my responsibility. Of course, it's my responsibility. There is no greater responsibility I have as a superintendent. So I will use the word safe until the last day I'm in this role. I don't apologize for it. So, so the idea uh, is that um, what's the spirit of this? The spirit of this is to wear a mask to protect yourself and to be a good community citizen and protect others. So what I can't control is gaming the system. Um, I, I can't. There would be no policy that would really account for all the different ways that there could be loopholes. So I'm going to just be blunt. The, the community has to decide what it want, you know, how much it's willing to invest in the safety of its students and in supporting the school district to do that. I also would say that, um, you know, teachers can't be in the position of, of um, you know, determining that's a good reason, that's a bad reason. All the more reason why policy, as well-defined as it can be, is going to be such an important tool for our teachers. Um, so to your specific question, um, there are certainly very reasonable times when the wearing of a mask would not be appropriate. And you just named a few, Brandy, and there would be others. If you are a severe asthmatic, um, any, anything that would restrict your airflow um, would be a significant challenge. And we certainly couldn't enforce uh, a mask wearing in that case. And so in such a case, um, either the policy would allow for it, which this policy does to some degree, um, um, and uh, we could specify it more, but the problem with specifying is that you will inevitably miss a category. And, and then it's like, oh, well, you didn't say this. And you know we get caught on those things all the time. And I frequently say, well, come on, what's the spirit of this we're aiming for? Um, but then the other thing that people may not realize is the number of problems that are resolved by our principals and teachers every single day on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, that just happens every single day. Um, and, and so I would say that um, we have to have a multi-pronged approach to this. So to be clear, uh, to your question as clear as I can be, I think that the board, I would welcome the board providing as much specificity as as it deems appropriate, bearing in mind that you will never come up with every example that could be a reasonable um, you know, disclaimer from the policy. And so we have to continue to try to work together to think about what's reasonable. Um, and then we will um, have to take things on a case by case basis. If a student has severe asthma, and they are in school on Monday and Tuesday, um, just because they have severe asthma doesn't mean they couldn't potentially be a risk to somebody else by not wearing a mask, but we are also required to teach them. And we certainly will without any regret or any question. So we'll have to figure out what's the best way to do that. But the reason I'm walking through this in such a long-winded way is that I think that there are some who would know, have occasionally offered, you know, well, what's the big deal? Just make this happen. Just do this. And, you know, if you've been in school for five minutes as a teacher or an administrator, you know that nothing is ever as simple as that. And, and so, um, so what the point of this policy is, is to try to provide clarity for our families, clarity for our students, and clarity for our teachers um, so that they you know, so that they can focus on their real job, which is not every five minutes to tell, you know, to have an argument with Jimmy and Susie about the wearing of masks. That's the position we were in uh, prior to tonight, which is what the governor's lack of leadership on this, if I might be so bold, um, left us in. And I'm sorry to say that, but I, I just, you know, that's, that's a fact as I see it. And I'm in the middle of this. And so that's how I see it. 
Are you finished, Brandy? Just one more follow up, um, but more. This is more for the board. Um, the would it be um, in our best interest to add some uh, additional verbiage surrounding those students that currently have a 504 or um, an IEP that they work with the 504 coordinators in their building um, or the IEP um, team to discuss um, including mask wearing as part of that particular student's um, plan. And the only reason why I say that is I agree with Mark that it should not be something left to the um, teacher to decide. But um, I know when, you know, I came in with a peanut allergy son, we had to make certain accommodations um, with the 504 coordinators. Um, and as we continue to move through each grade, that um, continues to be reassessed and we make sure that we've got, you know, appropriate plans set in place. So children and students that are in each building already have a coordinator that they're working with um, and we're already aware of some of those individual students' needs. So would it be um, something that we might want to entertain to add that into a plan with an IEP or a 504 coordinator's role to ensure that if a student does have an additional need relative to mask wearing, um, that that is also addressed in their plan? Yeah, for me, or um, I'm sorry. For you, for the board, for discussion, is that something that we would want to include in um, in that space when you're dealing with the 504 or the IEP plan? I mean, another alternative would be just simply some language that says um, exceptions will be granted. Exceptions should be directed um, to building leadership um, so that they can be handled on a case by case basis. Um, and that would allow the building leadership to be able to ascertain and work through those medical things without having to go through, because every time you change a 504, or, then you've got to have a meeting and that could be even more burdensome um, in an already burdensome situation. So, you know, perhaps just some language that it does explain that there are exceptions and they can be handled um, and we, that we give district leadership the authority to make those exceptions. That's just an idea. Okay, and so it's Lori and then Shannon. Okay, so um, I talked to my healthcare provider, I, I'm sure everyone has, and the discussion was around the K through fourth grade wearing masks. And according to my healthcare provider, they had concerns about them wearing masks, leaving masks, and touching their face too many times during the day with the mask on, but that could be counterproductive to wearing masks for, for small children. So I just wanted to put that out there. And the only other thing I wanted to say is I appreciate that we're having this deep discussion on masks and being prevention. You know, what is the prevention? Um, I think some of the prevention has to come also from, you know, the family, like, you know, uh, in the mornings before they're leaving, does their child have a temperature? you know, in, in homeroom every day, asking a set of questions about how is the student feeling that day. So we're, if anyone is not, is ill and shouldn't be in school, that we, you know, take care of that right away. Can, can I, uh, Cindy, would you mind if I just comment on that? Go right ahead, please do. So I just, I wanna, I, I thank board member Rothhaus for that um, uh, statement uh, because it's very much in line with what you know, we at the district have been trying to promote, and, and I just at the risk of beating a, a dead horse here, this is not a school's problem. This is a, this issue of the pandemic is a community problem. And the community has to come together to solve it. And I don't say this because the community hasn't, and I don't say it because I fear the community won't. I just, I, I just appreciate the, reminder that a community must um, and schools can do a lot of things but schools can't do everything and um, and and teachers can't do everything 
Um, and and it, it, it shouldn't uh, go without saying, but it, it, you know, it, it, it must be understood. Um, and so I very much appreciate the reminder that um, our families um, have to work with us um, on the sole objective of um, trying to reduce as much as possible the likelihood of, of transmission during this period when it's still a very active situation. So that's all. I just wanted to say thank you for the reminder. That's very, very important. Are you finished, Lori? Okay, Shannon? Um, I know we've taken a lot of testimony tonight, but we did look at two policies, and I just want to see if we could take a temperature of the board, um, which policy we would want to revisit at our next meeting. Andy? Well, I was going to comment on my view of the two policies that were read. Is that the next phase, or is that? <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think we moved the discussion there to see yeah. what you're leaning. Um, to see, because I think at, at one point, you know, if there's one that seems to match more, I mean, does it doesn't mean that it's take it as is or leave it. We have the right to craft this um, with our feedback. So if there's a way that you're leaning, I think it's important to get the pulse of the board and we can just continue the conversation along those lines. Sure. So I'll, I'll put the initial stake in the ground. So um, all along, I've had concerns about enforcement because there's so many differing views. I mean, just the, the poll, the, the, the polling and the, and the survey that we did to parents, the, the dramatic mix of different viewpoints was very surprising to me. Um, hearing uh, people talk, whether it's on the news and in social media forums, the, the viewpoints are all over the map, right? And it occurred to me that while we're talking about enforcement and trying to do a policy, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is create a a culture where the community that is there, so the group of kids that are in the schools or in our community, as Mark said, that the culture is there to do the right thing for each other. Whether, however you personally believe, you have to think about what the people around you are, are concerned about and think of, right? And for me, when I looked at the two policies, the one that is less restrictive, the one that has the difference for the younger students where there's more issues. I mean, to Lori's point, I've heard some of the same things about younger students not understanding how to wear masks as well. So trying to put rigor around them uh, is is more difficult. I, uh, as an example, that we've, we've all talked about, I'm sure done reading on different school openings across the globe. Um, one of the things that struck me in the the one in Israel that, that's gotten a lot of press lately is, is that the younger students tend to not spread it as much and are and t tend to follow the group mentality or the group uh, approach to things. And the bigger issue is when you started getting to kids in the middle school age, because as we know, anybody's had a middle schooler knows that they don't, they don't like to follow rules. They've got their own drummer they're marching to. So for me, the policy that is less restrictive on the younger students and more restrictive to create this culture for the older students matches better for what I want to be. And again, it's a, it's an enforcement. It's a, it's a, it's a policy that gives a little backbone to what we're trying to do. I think it's a, a really good thinking outside the box to, to sort of approach it this way. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the culture we want to create. I mean, we, as we go two months into this, I don't want to have to keep waving a policy or have Mark keep waving a policy to enforce it, but rather make the approach be that, Wearing a mask is the is the is the thing that the students in Merrimack want to do, and to me, that's I would support that policy. Um, I think you know putting some verbiage in to re you know to talk about where the where um, uh, where escalations or, or pushback can occur you know through the buildings building uh, building or even at the staff whatever Mark believes is more manageable is important to have in there. I think to the point of um, that Brandy did having a student with an IEP years ago when I had kids in school um, those IEPs carry 
and 504s deal with a whole lot of things, and mask wearing is just one dimension. So naturally, the the IP and the 504s tend to cover things like this. So I'd rather not call that out explicitly. I'd rather have the individual parents work with their care just just to be able to handle this, and that could end up being an exception based on the 504. So I'd rather not call that one out explicit. But anyway, but the bottom line for the sake of conversation is the least restrictive, the one that has the, the younger kids with least restrictions um, is the one that I would go with based on what I've seen. So thanks. Who's next, Lori? So just what Andy said, I think that, you know, our students have core values, you know, respect, responsibility, carriage, you know, character and courage. And we need to, it, it is about our school environment, our climate, and getting our students to understand that they have a responsibility, they need to be respectful. This is really important for their education. And 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 I believe in kids and I think that they, they will step up and do that. So I'm with you on number two. I think the younger kids, I think um, from my research, I think they shouldn't wear masks. Um, and then I think the older kids, it, it, it comes down to, we, we have this expectation of them, and uh, this is what we want them to do. Who's Brandy? What are your thoughts? Um, I agree. I um, I'm in full support of um, what we're trying to achieve. For sure, I definitely would like there to be some verbiage surrounding the escalation and, and trying to work with certain families um, because I, I do feel that that's important to include in there. Um, but I definitely am in support of the one um, that has the separation between pre-K to third and then fourth and on uh, to 12. So um, I would be in full support of that as long as we could include that additional verbiage. Shannon? I tend to believe that when we're dealing with younger children and we're going to create more contact by enforcing masks than, you know, trying to get them to help them put them on and those kind of things, that will, I think, kind of create more work than we're looking to, to address as well. Uh, so when it comes down to it, um, I, would, I would tend to kind of go with the majority on that as well. Thank you. And, and my thought is I like the less restrictive one um, because I think it's more reasonable. Um, and certainly when you start to add complete discomfort of having a mask on for you know, all of those hours every day, that can disrupt learning as well. Um, so if students are socially distanced and they have at least six feet behind them, they're not um, commingling and they're learning, then um, that seems very reasonable to me. Um, my only concern uh, with that is, um, and I, I want to do a little more research when we go through the future readings of these, and we'll talk about that shortly. Um, I want to have a little more research on those younger students. I'm, um, I'm uncomfortable, you know, at this point signing off on that until I do the research um, that I feel that I need to do as part of my responsibility. Um, to the board and to the community because I just don't have that research and I'm not a doctor. So I think most importantly for us here, this is a big decision for our community. This affects people's lives. I mean, literally can affect people's lives, our, the community lives, our teachers, our students, those families, all of them, it's a big decision. And I think that, you know, what we're faced with, we're not going to make everybody happy. There's just no way. There's a lot of unhappy people, no matter how we proceed. What I can ask is that we do that in trying to do the right thing, trying to be as thoughtful as we can, um, trying to do our research and base our decisions on facts. And, and, and then I think we're doing a good job. And I'm very uh, pleased that we actually are having this discussion tonight because I feel really good about um, the safety measure, again, as it relates to our teachers, our kids, families and the community, the broader community. Um, so I guess it sounds like we pretty much have um, unanimously, we're leaning towards that less restrictive policy. Um, and I'll let Mark, I'll let you walk through kind of the next steps um, as it relates to, oh, Andy? I just wanna say, so, 
the policy, the way that it's written is, I think, sound. But as came up in some of the discussions, we talked about lunch and other things where there's commingling. I think that the important thing is to take a policy like that and make sure that the implementation of what a school day is like allows that policy to be effective. Because it's very um, ambiguous about, I mean, like, for example, let's take lunch for a minute. If we assume that everybody's in the hallway wearing a mask and then they go in the lunchroom and they're all sitting at tables and take a mask off to eat, social distancing in that in any of those cafeterias anybody's had a kid there knows that's not possible to do so this policy loses its teeth if we create an environment where social distancing can't be guaranteed for this kind of thing i mean if anybody's you know eating in a restaurant or eating outside you know that you're with a cohort of people that you trust but you're socially distanced from co cohorts that you don't know so i think the important part is, is to make sure that the methodology we use for kids when they're in the school allows this policy to be effective so we don't have to put all these caveats in the policy and restrictions and things like that. I mean, that's, for me, that's the second leg or one of the other legs of the stool that we got to consider here. So I just wanted to say that. Send out, I, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mark. Well, I just wanted to address uh, Andy's uh, point very briefly because it's, it's important. So um, we have been working really, really hard on just that kind of thing. Uh, because we, we don't want, I mean, we want to have a policy that works for us and we don't want to do anything um, in our practices that go against our policy. That would be totally defeating. So we just, I, I was on a Zoom uh, call for three hours uh, this morning with our leadership team and we had a vigorous discussion about the very issue of lunch. So, you know, I don't think it's... Um, breaking any confidence to say that, um, you know, um, what we were really discussing was um, if there are a lot of reasons why it would be very challenging to have lunches served in the classroom. Um, however, if you bring students into the lunchroom, even in a hybrid model where you have fewer students, um, and if you take the high school, you would have multiple lunches, so you would reduce that number further, but still, um, that becomes its own enforcement issue, as Andy just said, and lunch is supposed to be a nice break in a student's day, so, you know, do you then want to just turn that into, you know, a thing? Um, so, so we've really talked about what are the logistics around being able to provide lunch in, in class. Um, that's going to require potentially conversations uh, with um, uh, DOE, particularly uh, nutrition department. Um, we currently have a waiver that allowed us to distribute lunches that didn't meet uh, always the letter of the law um, from FDA. Um, but that was, you know, that was an agreement that they uh, allowed us, that they made that allowed us to, all schools to do that so that we could actually give students food. The question is, would they allow that? So for any, again, my point is for anybody who thinks these things aren't complicated, um, everything is complicated. Um, and so we're not ready at the moment to say what we're going to do with lunch, but I want to assure the board and assure anybody listening that we are not going, I mean, we've gone this far, we're not going to be careless now and create a uh, practice that runs afoul of the spirit of the policy that we've just spent, you know, tonight talking about. So I, I very much appreciate um, Andy's uh, comment, and I just want to reassure everybody that uh, we're very mindful of that particular issue. And it's part of the reason why we can't always come to you, uh, you know, with answers. But yet, yeah, we'll have most of this sewn up by August 10th. Um, but you know, these things are big deals. Is simple. So. Yeah, and, and Mark, just to follow on that, I think, as, as is true with everything, the devil's going to be in the details on this one here. So uh, some districts have published a lot of details, some less. I think having us be as specific as we can, sort of a handbook of sorts that we could go with, will answering this and others, will certainly help to 
remove a lot of the questions that people have and make it very clear. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're prepared to do that, but I, I look forward to blending that sort of a document along with the policy that we've been talking about tonight. So. Yeah, thank you. Okay, who's next? Did I see Lori's hand? Shannon? Earlier, but Mark answered it. Okay, great. Um, so Mark, so our next reading for this is on the August 10th? Yes. Um, so at that time, we can, this gives us time. I wanna make sure that we give the community ample time to give us feedback um, on something so important. And, um, and then we can decide if we, based on what feedback we've received and the changes that have been incorporated that we've discussed tonight, uh, we can decide if we want to go for the third reading. Um, but I don't, what I do want to do is if we do a third reading, we'll need to do another emergency board meeting because we have to get this information out to our families as quickly as we can. Um, and for all sorts of reasons um, in, in um, the community and our teachers so that they understand there's a lot of anxiety around going back and certainly understanding what we've put in place um, is really important to them. And the other thing is that um, it also gives parents time, uh, particularly of the younger children, um, depending on how we move forward with that, um, to be able to practice at home for an hour, increase usage to get used to wearing a mask. And you know, all of those things are important as we look at transitioning um, and getting ready for the school year. It just makes it that much more complicated getting ready for back to school. So I think what we'll do is we'll already put this on the agenda for August 10th and then um, from there, we'll decide um, probably in advance. I'll check your availability just so we have some placeholders uh, for um, a potential third meeting, you know, sometime shortly after that, if that sounds okay to everyone. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, so just to follow along the idea of process. So um, what, what I will do then is taking the feedback from the board tonight. Uh, Mrs. Chaffrey used to do the same thing. So if it's okay with you, what I'll do is for August 10th, I will highlight in yellow um, things that are added based on this conversation tonight. I will, you know, strike through the things that we've perhaps wanted to remove so that at the August 10th meeting, you'll have the option to see the policy was, was presented to you tonight, but then you'll see highlighted the the parts that were added or deleted or, or whatever so that you can see how it has morphed um and then you'll have you know that basis upon which to make a decision so if that's okay with you that's what i'll do for august 10th okay that sounds great um that sounds perfect and then um dr mclaughlin i wonder if you would talk a little bit about what you have planned for tomorrow night yeah so um really happy to um to say that um, tomorrow night, uh, assistant superintendents uh, Fabrizio and Chevenel are gonna join me uh, for a virtual town hall. This is not a board meeting. This is just the three uh, superintendents. Uh, we have received, as you can imagine, a lot of questions. Um, it's been very, very difficult to answer individual questions. The volume just really can't allow that. But also because many questions, and I, I tried to say this in my um, message last Friday, um, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. A lot of people wanted answers to questions before they made decisions about what they were gonna do about returning to school. And yet I would say, we can't give you the answers to some of those things until we know if you're coming back to school. And that's just, that's again, one of the many, many uh, conundrums that uh, we, been facing and uh if uh so so on july 13th we provided i think quite a bit of detail um to the board and the community about um many of the things that we could answer for sure and those can be found uh and have been able to be found since july 13th on our website um and many around uh curriculum especially around how remote learning is gonna look different and better. And even though the policy that we are talking about tonight um, said very clearly that um, you know, remote learning is not a substitute for uh, on location learning, that's true. 
but I, I don't want to give anybody on the board of the community the impression that, um, that we haven't made improvements to remote learning. We've learned and, and it's gonna be a lot better. Um, but in any event, we now have a few more answers to questions. And so in an effort to continue to reach out to the community, we're going to um, uh, really read those questions. Um, some are pertain to safety and infrastructure. And so Matt Chevenel will answer those. Some pertain to curriculum and instruction. And so uh, John Fabrizio will answer those. And then others, uh, that have to do with um, other matters, um, you know, let's say would be answered by me. Um, so we've collected those questions. Um, we're going to read the questions tomorrow uh, and then we're going to provide as many answers as we can. We're also going to just um, uh, provide a, additional information just in the, in the uh, sort of in the introduction. I'll forecast tonight something uh, that we'll be prepared to uh, say again tomorrow, but since we're all together, um, when we've talked about masks, uh, it's very important um, if we're going to uh, require our staff to wear masks, which is something that we can more readily do. And we've worked with our associations on this issue, and I'm pleased to say that we've been great partners. Um, then we must provide them with, with those tools. And so we have uh, Merrimack uh, Tomahawk Blue masks um, that every staff member will get, will receive two. Um, so they can wear one and then uh, come home and wash it and wear the other one and the next day wash that. And so that's just one very small example of the things that we're trying to do both to show support to our teachers in this particular case, but also um, to model the very kinds of behaviors that we uh, want um, to see. Um, but there's a lot more safety uh, things that we're going to be answering and addressing tomorrow and a lot of progress made on curriculum. So we're really excited about that. It's going to start sharp at 6.30 uh, and it will end sharp at 8. Um, and in addition to that, I will um, continue my uh, periodic messages. You know, I've, I've um, for the time being, I've um, stopped the daily messages uh, that I did from March to May. Uh, my brain just was getting a little fried on that. But um, you know, I will continue to ramp up providing information in that forum. We'll continue to use Facebook and School Messenger uh, to provide updates. Um, and, uh, and so we'll try to continue to, um, you know, communicate uh, developing things as we go. But as long as we're here, I just want to remind everybody tonight, if there were answers to every question that you had, we would answer them because it helps nobody to not provide answers. It's painful to say don't know yet. I only hope that people realize the complexity of what we're facing. And so lunch that we talked a little bit about tonight is just one small example of, of what I'm talking about. Um, it involves entities that are outside of our district. Um, and I can't say we're going to do this or that. And then a few weeks later, tell you, no, nope, spoke too soon, can't do that. That would be worse than saying nothing, in my opinion. I'd rather wait tell you honestly, don't know. And then when I tell you, you can take it to the bank. And so that's what we're, that's what we're doing with so many things still. But having said that, we've made a lot of progress uh, up to June 13th, uh, July 13th, when we presented to the board a lot of specifics. And in the weeks since then, even more so. And now tonight, I feel like we've jumped leaps and bounds ahead with the beginning of closure around masks. So um, anyway, so really looking forward to tomorrow night. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, sell it. And then there'll be um, an announcement coming out um, later this evening, if it hasn't already, um, that will just provide um, our community with information about accessing um, the um, event tomorrow night. Okay, great. Um, does anyone have any comments before we move on to the public comments on agenda items? Uh, no, just the comment that I'm looking right now, and it's it's not up on the website yet. So hopefully it'll be there later this evening. Okay. Right. And then, uh, Dr. McLaughlin, if you could put the policy that we're leaning towards um, out on the website so that it can be viewed by the public, um, I'd appreciate it. And I know yeah. I just want to reiterate um, again, you know how concerned we are about the safety of our kids, our staff, our teachers. 
um, in the entire communities. Um, and I, I, can't, I can't emphasize that enough. Any comments? All right, so Shannon. Shannon is kind enough to um, read through these for us if we don't have too many yet. Um, I'm going to say bear with me. Um, I do. I will start with the forms, but I did get uh, a number of families as the meeting went on, kind of responded and responded and responded. So I'm going to try to capture all of that by person. And that way we'll try to get through it in an orderly fashion, but it may be a little clumsy jumping um, email to email. So I'm going to start with the forms and we did receive five. And so I will run through those first. We have Carrie Arguin Newton for Reese Drive. I want to thank the district for giving parents a choice in how their children go back to school. I also want to urge our community to insist that masks be worn by students and teachers while they're at school if the six foot, I think it got cut off in the character limits. Oh, no, nope. never mind. Sorry about that. Hold on. Distance cannot be maintained, which I understand completely. I do believe children will benefit from returning to school in person, but I want every precaution taken to keep my daughter safe. The CDC has made it clear that from what we know right now, six feet social distancing and or masks are our best precautions. Thank you. Next is Carolyn Harold, 31 Valley View Drive. Masks are a very simple way to mitigate the spread of the virus. There is no evidence that any other one device that can keep students and staff safe. While there is no vaccine, a mask is a necessity for schools to open. Next is Justin Hansen, 45 Mallard Point. The science says wear masks. Massive corporations with more money and resources know to have staff and customers wear masks. I can't imagine the school struggle to enforce wearing shirts, shoes, or not wearing hats. Masks are new, but not challenging once normalized. Uh, the next one is Sneha Shashadara at uh, 37 Augusta Circle in Sneha. I hope I did a good job with your name. Um, I did have a, grow up with a Sneha, so I know I got that part right. Um, so uh, does the board have a plan for kids who have parents who are, on, who are at high risk to contract COVID? Next is from Zachary Oser from Four Haynes Terrace. I appreciate the board taking the time to communicate with us and I recognize this is not an easy issue to address. It is my hope that you will choose to enforce the wearing of masks in all circumstances, including sitting in, and I'm scrolling again with the characters, sitting in classrooms. Uh, if you do choose the lesser option for the younger children, will you find a way to prevent anyone who contacts these students from also coming into contact with older students? And I think that is it for the forums. And now um, this is where the interesting challenge begins. Uh, so we have Taryn Swenson at 38 Marty Drive. I'm greatly concerned about the encouraging of face mask use in schools for children. School as a hybrid environment will be a mental distraction and challenging enough without something covering their face all day long. They do not have the ability to focus and learn while covering their nose and mouth. It is not a natural feeling. Even if they can keep it on, they will con be constantly touching it, which means they are not focusing on the lessons and negating any protection it supposedly provides. Our children will not be receiving a quality education if the use of masks is required in the classroom. The kids will suffer more emotionally and educationally in comparison to any safety a mask can provide. Um, the next one did not re uh, re reply with an address, so we will not be entering that into the record. Uh, the next one is Daniel Fournier from 42 Berkeley Street. Uh, how come Merrimack didn't require masks for school reopening and mostly all other surrounding towns are mandated? Um, and by the way, some of these responses did come before our meeting started tonight. So um, obviously um, it may be out of context from, from what we discussed this evening. Um, and the ones so far that I've read have come before our meeting started. The next is Donna Talbot from Five Bryant Circle. Will Merrimack be willing to change their mind from encouraging mask use to a mask mandate before the start of school so kids that choose to go to school can be as safe as possible? Um, we have Alex Latsko and British Bridget Boyle from 37 Great Stone Drive. Uh, let's see. 
I have three children in the Merrimack school system and honestly I'm scared about the conditions for opening without proper social distancing and absolutely consistent mask wearing given the current conditions it's not if the schools become a hot outbreak but when unfortunately I hate being torn between safety and education since it's pretty obvious to me that unless Merrimack goes all in on distance learning as opposed to the valiant stopgap from March I may as well pull the kids out and let forage on the internet and repeat their current grade once school resumes post vaccine. Even if COVID-19 shows lower morbidity for children, it is still both potentially fatal to them and unlike the common cold or flu, is showing long-term systemic degradation in a significant percentage of younger patients is being discovered. And you uh, provide a link to the CDC, uh, which is recovery from COVID-19 can take a long time even in young adults with no chronic conditions. Um, and then he goes on to say, is the town prepared for the long-term effects on both student health and the certain disease transmission to older and more fragile members of their families? Maybe as an adult, I will be able to deal with 20 years of lung or liver issues. Children are at risk for unknown and significantly longer period time period. We must be led by science and not partisan politics, opening the schools when the state house is closed reeks of a misplaced agenda. Next, we have Megan Shepard and uh, she is an um, a incoming junior this year, uh, so we will not be giving an address. My name is Megan Shepard, and I'm going into my junior year at Merrimack High School. Over the past week, I've collected just under 500 signatures on a petition to require masks in the district schools. Many students and parents are concerned about going back to school because masks are only strongly encouraged, which increases the risk of students, staff, and parents of contracting COVID-19. As stated from the last board meeting on July 13th, the best known and most readily available mitigation strategies are social distancing, masks, and hand washing. In addition, the reopening board presentation also states that the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences state that transmission, transmission via people with no symptoms or during the few days before symptoms are apparent is a primary driver of COVID-19 spread, as well as John Hop a John Hopkins study, which believe in the power of masks. I would first like to state that in the study, things are not believed, they are proven. Secondly, in, if the reopening for presentations information is correct, then why is the district choosing not to not require masks when they are proven to help prevent the spread of COVID-19? Thank you for your time. Megan Shepard, class of 2022. Next we have Matthew Coyne of 22 Bradford Drive. And what happens if a teacher or custodian tests positive for COVID? This is the question. Um, we are on to Tim Burns of 35 uh, Old Blood Road. And his comment is, our family very much appreciates the thoughtfulness, hard work and diligence to get our kids back to school. Thank you. The science is indisputable that temperatures above 100.4 indicate some level of infection for some type of virus or infection. The survey disproportionately showed that parents want temperature checks. This process needs to be executed by members of the district or some other independent entity and not left to parents to self-select. I respect the parents and their integrity, but this cannot, can't be an honor system as it leaves too much up to individual interpretation. The survey also showed parents are willing to volunteer. This may provide the staffing required to check students prior to getting on the bus or allowed in school. There are a number of online background check tools that can be utilized to screen volunteers. I would be glad to develop the process and protocols. Next, we have Lisa Martino of Five Shore Drive. My name is Lisa Martino and my daughter goes to JMU sixth grade. My question is about parents that are choosing remote learning as an option that was given to them. If it is the case that more children are staying home, will the children who want to go every day be allowed if the numbers work out that way? Next, we have, I think it's at the end, Katie Bowler, 8 Jade Road. Dear members of the Dear Merrimack School Board members and Merrimack education officials, if the school district can require a dress code, it most certainly can require face mask wearing. I hope that you will reconsider your decision about mask wearing in Merrimack public schools. A lot has changed since the decision was made about strongly encouraging but not requiring masks to be worn, including 
more scientific evidence has come out to show that masks are one of the most effective ways of preventing the spread of COVID-19. There has been at least one study showing tweens and teens may transmit the virus more than other age groups. Almost all stores across the state are now requiring masks, individuals to wear masks. And then more states, uh, counties, and towns and cities are now requiring face masks in public. The district can come up with reasonable accommodations, including not mandating mask wearing for students that are unable to wear them for medical slash behavioral reasons or for children in a grades two or below, incorporating mask breaks throughout the day. Please look to other districts and states for guidance. Do not let politics guide your decision. Stand with the staff and children of Merrimack using scientific evidence. Histori history will look back on this and you will want to be on the right side, standing strong and protecting the residents of Merrimack. I look forward to you making the right decision. Thank you for your time, Katie Bowler. Next is I have this one. Um, whoops, over scrolled. And it is, sorry about this. Troy Trudell, 19 Derry Street, Merrimack. A lot of these I had to go back and get their addresses, so I'm scrolling through the back and forth of it, so apologies. Hello, school board. With all due respect, there are no both sides to the mask topic. Masks have been proven to stop the spread of the virus and there are no adverse reactions to mask wearing. We need to stop the both sides rhetoric when our children's and community's health is involved. Sincerely, Troy Trudell. Next, and this one has a series of emails, so bear with me again. It's Linda LaCoyer, seven page drive. I would like to know how enforcing the mask policy is any different from enforcing the hat wearing policy and the dress code policy. Can it not simply be enforced the same way? Going on to the next um, email from her, how is it easier to enforce a mask policy only if students are closer than six feet away rather than wearing it all the time? These are children and teens. There will be those that attempt to claim they are further apart than they actually are. Common sense is not always easy to maintain in certain situations. And finally, may I ask what the school board will be resuming in-person meetings rather than remote meetings. Next is Mark Heimberg, 7 Linda Lane. Uh, dear school committee, to open schools without mandating masks, which are proven to work, is to put students and teachers at risk that is not in the best interest of our schools and our community. Many students and teachers have already compromised health, and this puts them at risk uh, at orders of magnitude greater than their peers and colleagues. In our educational environment, we focus on equity and inclusion. This is in direct contrast to not enforcing the use of masks to protect those at greater risk. If we are unable to mandate and enforce mask usage, it tells me that schools are not ready to reopen our schools for in-person learning. I thank you for your service and your attention to this matter. Thank you, Mark. Next is Sherry Trifall. 15A Harris Avenue. Um, I have strong reservations about returning to school during this pandemic. I have a grandson that my husband and I are raising. He is in elementary school and since he started preschool, he has managed to pick up everything going through the school, colds, strep throat, and the flu, even though we had our flu shots. And usually early to mid spring, we get everything through going through the house. My grandson washes his hands, how long? touches his face and even touches just about everything. And even with our constant reminding that you need to do goes right out the window. We have worn masks from the beginning of the pandemic and have limited contact. Uh, our grandson has been staying home and we try to avoid going to stores with him and he is fine with that, thankfully. I do know that he wants to hang out with his friends and at that age, keeping them apart, good luck. Can't blame them. It's much like a beach scene. Social distancing is missing. There is no perfect solution right now, but at least at the home front, there is more control over how many people, etc. Not only him, but the rest of the family as well. With physical school, there will there are many there are to be many variables, and especially in an elementary school, you are dealing with an age group that are vulnerable. I don't see the point of opening schools, even for the short, is worth the risk. I do understand how important this physical school is. Our grandson has some learning issues. Who knows how things will be in a month. The more you open, it seems you risk going backwards 
with the number of states dealing with that right now, I don't think it's even worth talking school. Uh, talking school. Um, next is from Melinda Hewitt at, uh, there's another email on that. It's 106 Wilson Hill Road. Hello, I find it difficult to say as a parent that I'm fully on board with any one of the suggested mandates, although I agree that at, least, at the very least, pre-K through third should not be required to wear masks. It is difficult for me to comment in the recent, uh, in the recess mask requirement. We have not heard any details as to what recess will look like and how it will even be possible to keep kids socially distanced during recess. I feel as though they are outside. Social distancing is not as critical as they should not be required to wear masks there. I do. I should also note that I have firsthand experience that an emergency child care center that my daughter attended from prior to the outbreak in the spring until Joe only requires uh, the teachers to wear the masks. None of the children in uh, through kindergarten are required to wear masks uh, or have been required to wear masks and there have been zero infections the entire time. Uh, There's another email from her so I'm going to jump to that and say let's see um, I have some concerns with children wearing having to wear masks during resource recess or doing any sort of physical activity but we as parents have not heard any details around what that looks like yet. Teachers this coming fall are, in my opinion, should be considered essential employees, such, just as grocery workers, retail store clerks, etc., have been required to wear face coverings. I believe that teachers and staff should also be required to do so during the day while they're in school with the students. Uh, while I've started talking to my children about wearing a mask as much as they can when they're in school, I think it will be difficult to enforce the younger age brackets. For reference, my two children will be in third and first grade. So back to um, Sabrina Gasca, 19 Maidstone Drive. And let me scroll down. If masks are being required, why are we even go doing hybrid? Neither policies presented voids in the mask usage, so sending all kids to school seems to be appropriate. Another email from her is, what data are we waiting for? Our current data already shows COVID cases incredibly decreasing in New Hampshire and hybrid plus masks are still being required. What exactly is the school waiting for? Danielle Fasquel, I hope I got that right, 46 Hanson Drive, Merrimack. And that is, what qualifies an at-risk child under uh, that code to be removed? Um, so I think it was about the at-risk, um, the code for those at risk of infecting others. And I'm assuming that uh, based on what's being read. We have Rob Bashney of 18 Fairway Drive. Uh, thank you for trying to do the best thing for all of our kids. I was really disappointed in the suggested mask. And after listening to the meeting, fully support the less stringent model. Um, Another email came in early from earlier, so back with Linda LaCoyer, and that is when will the teachers of Merrimack be provided with all with all the new information you have given here? And I'm going through making sure I didn't miss any, and I think I got them all, but I have a couple where I was looking for emails. And just a response. Um, I pre just another. Um, I'll I'll try to. I'm not going to be able to put this into testimony because there was some stuff that was not allowed in our our, our, our rule meeting. So uh, I appreciate all your efforts to take care of this issue. And this is from Sabrina Gasca again. Um, however, myself and others feel that decisions are made without much public participation. Uh, thank you for making me aware of a rule and we're good. So um, that is, I, I believe all we have. Thank you, Shannon. And thanks to everyone who took the time um, to enter into public comments. Um, so there's no manifest to sign. So this concludes our meeting for this evening. So, so motion to adjourn. Well, we have a motion to adjourn. 
Made uh, by Lori, seconded by Andy. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 The motion car carries 500. Thank you and good night. Merrimack TV is committed to our community. From gavel to gavel coverage of town and school board meetings to updates on town services and projects, we aim to keep you connected. Uh, good morning, I'm Kyle Fox, Public Works Director for the Town of Merrimack. Hi, I'm Diane Trippett. I'm the Town Clerk Tax Collector for the Town of Merrimack. I'm Captain Matt Tarleton with the Merrimack New Hampshire Police Department. And keep the public informed of every motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye and many moments so you can be confident that we're here for you. Thanks for watching. Stay connected. Follow Merrimack TV on Facebook.